Hello and welcome to the Managing Uncertainty Podcast. This is Brian Strausser, Principal and Chief Executive here at BrightPath. And in episode 220, we're doing something a little different. I have an interview today with Jeremy Bauman, Managing Partner of Corporate Security Advisors. Earlier this year, Jeremy and I co-authored a white paper together on the value of a Global Security Operations Center, or GSOC. With that in mind, here's my interview with Jeremy Bauman from Corporate Security Advisors. With me today is Jeremy Bauman, Managing Partner of Corporate Security Advisors, or CSA. Jeremy, tell us, uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Great to uh, great to be with you to, to have the conversation today. Uh, as you said, Managing Partner, Corporate Security Advisors, uh, we are a boutique consulting firm. I've been engaged in the corporate security and law enforcement space now for just a little more than 25 years. Started out in local law enforcement, uh, chasing bad guys through the cornfields in, in Illinois, and eventually had the opportunity to move into the corporate security space uh, and worked my way up through the ranks. I spent eight years with a global pharmaceutical company uh, before I had the opportunity to go be head of enterprise security for a financial services firm and build out their security program before launching our uh, consulting practice a few years ago to be able to to bring the kinds of services that we had built in the the corporate security sector to multiple clients uh, organizations so uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today so we're here today to talk about global security operations centers or what some companies might call a security operations center or central monitoring facility or something like that um we first started working together on these kind of ideas about 10 or 11 months ago we were helping a university uh, that has a global presence in several countries and has study abroad programs and cooperative education programs in several countries dozens of countries and we really helped them build out their strategy around global security and specifically how to centralize those in a global security operations center. My experience with this came from my previous employer. I was at a Fortune 30 retailer for uh, two decades. And in my last role for about six years, I uh, built and then led their global security operations centers. There were two of them in uh, here in Minneapolis and one in Bangalore, India. and. I think had a similar experience. We had to figure out like what was the business case? How did we get this built originally? How did we evolve those capabilities over time? And then how did we expand it to a second facility in order to really provide all of the localized support that the organization needed for a company that did 75 billion in sales and was operated in 40, 45 countries at the time? Your experience was similar. You. Um, built a global security operations center in a company that had struggled to build something like that for quite some time. Tell us a little bit about that kind of business case and experience that you went through. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the first GSOC experience I, I had, I actually inherited the GSOC and had to revamp the GSOC at, at one of the, the larger organizations I worked at. And in doing that, we were also in a major globalization effort at that time across 76 countries. Uh, 100,000 PNRs a year in terms of individual travel uh, instances that our employees were taking. So had people going to all sorts of different level risk countries, had all different types of facilities uh, all around our global footprint and really had to realign the, the GSOC, which had been primarily based on U.S. operations to be able to deal with 35 different languages, to be able to deal with travelers going all over the world. Uh, and so that was really the, the foundation was being able to, to meet the business need uh, that gave me the, uh, the foundation, I'd say, to, uh, to be able to build the GSOC Greenfield from, uh, for the next organization. You know, and at that organization, the the challenge they'd been running into, their, that security program had been trying to get approval to build a GSOC for nearly two decades. Uh, they they had started early on, they had built some stuff very organically, but had never really pulled it together into a true GSOC concept. And so when I was brought in there, that was one of the mandates that, uh, that I was given was we will have, I, I, at the time I worked for a former FBI executive who was used to having the kind of capabilities that he had in the federal government. Mm -hmm. 
And he wanted those replicated to be able to protect the organization we worked for. And so we had to come at it from a business perspective. And that really is the foundation of all of the, the work that we do helping organizations now from a security perspective is thinking about it from that business perspective. You know, in this case, we had 11 local security operations centers all replicating activities in individual locations around the world. And so the business case that we brought to leadership was, you know, we need 7.2 million in capital uh, to build out two redundant GSOC locations. But if you'll give us that money, we'll reduce operating expense by 2.1 million a year. Uh, and it became a net positive impact to the PL over 10 years of just over $10 million. So all along, while we're enhancing the security program, enhancing our ability to protect employees, putting together a, a remarkable tool set in the hands of our security team, we're actually delivering to the bottom line as well. We're becoming more efficient, higher performing. And that was really what resonated with the, the business leadership that had to approve it. That presentation to the finance leadership to, to gain approval to our COO and, and to the CFO was less than two minutes long. There was no extensive justification. It was really a financial presentation of how we were going to deliver bottom line results, which by framing it in terms of what they uh, were most you know, focused on, which was business performance, overall business performance, the security benefits became the corollary benefit of what we were trying to achieve. And that was the way that, that we really set the foundation. We're able to accomplish what stands today as one of the, one of the really uh, most remarkable GSOC operations in the U.S. One of the challenges I think, we've talked on this podcast before, one of the challenges that resilience leaders are faced with and that security leaders are faced with is making that business case. Where did you learn how to, where, where did you draw upon in order to understand how to do that? You know, I, I can't say that, uh, that I learned at any one specific place. For me, it was trial and error. We had to, to come up with what worked for the organization. And I ultimately sought out mentorship with, within the organizations that I worked for people who I saw were successful leaders in, in other areas of responsibility. And when I talked to those individuals who were engaged with leadership in their respective functions, whether it was law or human resources or finance, those were the individuals who helped guide me to, to think uh, about framing what I needed in terms that the executive leadership of our organization uh, was thinking. And, you know, as an example, if I have that rare moment of time with the executive leader of an organization, regardless of what position it is, and I squander it talking about some program that I want to put in place, it, it doesn't resonate with an, a busy executive leader who's worrying about multi-million or multi-billion dollar problems. Mm -hmm. And so helping my mentors, helping me understand that by framing it in terms of a strategic approach and framing it in terms of how it's going to impact the macro business environment, that was where I saw success. And I think it was those successes that reinforced the approach and helped me to find other people within the corporate security arena who thought the same way that I was learning to think and be able to use them as a sounding board to just continue to grow that approach into what we do today. When you were developing that business case, did you talk with folks at other companies that you knew that had done something similar? Actually, we didn't. No. Um, it was really all internal uh, when we were talking about the business justification. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly at that point, we engaged outside consultation when it came to the concept design for mm -hmm. uh, the GSOC, when it came to the detailed engineering drawings and uh, putting it all together and, and making sure that it worked. Uh, but in terms of the business case itself, the people that we worked with the most was the finance representatives within our organization to be able to, to take the opportunities that we thought we had and to be able to shape the argument in a way that was going to, to be able to win the, the day when we had to make the presentation. Mm -hmm. 
Where, where do you see other companies struggle with that business case development? What, what do you think holds them back? I would say two areas that I'll, I'll touch on primarily. One, within, within executive leadership and organizations, I don't think most executive leaders have high enough expectations of their security teams. Uh, it's unfortunate, but there's almost this idea that security people have this magic potion or magic knowledge that uh, other people in business don't have. And so I don't think we always get held to the same standard. I don't think the our executive uh, presence, our soft skills, our ability to to think like a business leader are always held to the same standard. And I think because of that, it it keeps executive leadership from holding security programs accountable to uh, to that same standard. And that's really the starting point, because if expectations are at that level, then the executive leadership of an organization is going to hold a program accountable to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I think, the, the first area that falls down. I, I think the second area that that is probably the biggest opportunity is that security people tend to be very type A, very hands-on, the sort of people who believe they can do everything themselves. And the analogy that, that I always use when we talk about this with uh, anyone who has never done a strategy, strategy becomes this scary term. And some pe you get half of the crowd that, that takes the emperor's new clothes approach and, and wants to pretend that they, they know what uh, developing a strategy is and they don't want to admit that they don't know or they've never done it before. And you get the other half of the room that just is so intimidated by strategy because they can't define it that they just shy away from it and they just simply focus on the tactical. They just do the day-to-day, -day, they mm -hmm. focus on all the fires in front of them and they never take the time. Uh, Ken Sensor on our team, is he's a fantastic individual. Career as an agency executive, uh, became the first assistant director with uh, the FBI for security and ultimately was the SVP at the largest retailer in the world for security and loss prevention. And when I asked him that question about, you know, you were really the first, one of the first individuals at your organization in a post 9-11 environment to start to build the security organization, how, how did you find the time to, to break from the tactical to, to be able to have the time to focus on strategy? And you know what, he told me we worked six days a week there. And so I had to take that seventh day every week to set it aside and half of it was for personal time and half of it was to work on my strategy because I had to come up with what my strategic approach was going to be before I was gonna be credible with my executive leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly, you know, when, when you have never developed a strategy before, the, the other analogy that we like to talk about is when, when you turn 16, and your parents hand you the keys to your, your first car or to their car to drive, that doesn't automatically mean you're also bestowed with the knowledge how to build the car, right? And you need to, to go buy a car that's already built. You need to hire someone to put a car together for you if you're the classic car type and, and you want to build something specific. But that's a specific skill set. And so... It's okay if you've never done a strategy before, if you've never done a strategy program, uh, never done a strategy project before, to go seek help from professionals who do that for a living. As consultants, that's how we make our living. Mm -hmm. We help organizations put those strategies together. We've got that track record of being able to go in. And I think sometimes uh, security leaders especially feel like if, if they just see your, your, the deck that you use to present, that they'll know how to put that strategy together. It's not the deck. It's the process of building the strategy. It's the way in which we go about it. It's that, the mindset. Absolutely. That really makes you uh, win the day with an approval of an effective strategy and then be able to take that into a business planning, business case development setting. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the, the, what are some of the core benefits, I guess, to a company in building a GSOC, in centralizing those capabilities in a global security operations center? The, the single most 
uh, I would say relevant benefit to organizations is the fact that a, a GSOC is the most financially efficient way to deliver high performance security and protection to your organization. Bar, bar none with the technology available today, if we have to cut everything else in security, if we have a GSOC that is monitoring all sorts of inputs and has the ability to generate uh, the effective outputs, you can pair that back to a small 24 by seven by 365 team. And no matter what industry vertical you're in, no matter how many employees you have, that's the single most cost-effective way to deliver security value to your organization. Mm -hmm. Where, where do you think companies have struggled with kind of pulling that argument together around why build a GSOC? What's the financial case? What are the benefits in doing so? Well, again, I think there there's a lack of understanding of what's possible in a GSOC. So we spend a lot of time conversing with the company executives about uh, the old analogy of getting left a boom. Mm -hmm. Right. You can stop bad things from happening as as security leaders. We we need to be very effective at response when bad things happen. We have to protect people, our environment, our assets, our reputation. And so when something bad happens, we need to be able to respond effectively and put that genie back in the bottle to the extent possible. But there's also a huge data set out there that we can tap into to keep those bad things from happening. There is all sorts of information in uh, your organization's domain, in the public domain, that when you combine those data sets, you can start to anticipate the potential bad things that might happen and take steps to mitigate uh, the impact of those or potentially even stop those from happening whether that's you know picking up on uh, leakage on social media from a potential uh, active shooter type threat, whether that's uh, environmental scanning programs to be able to, to detect insider threat. There's all sorts of, of information and data sets that you can combine in a GSOC environment that allow you to rapidly synthesize information and data and create a picture that you would not have been able to piece together until after the fact, absent that GSOC environment. Mm -hmm. So for the organizations that say, gosh, if we could have only stopped that from happening, GSOC with a well-designed intelligence program is exactly how you stop mm -hmm. those bad things from happening. And I wanna be clear, you're not gonna stop every bad thing from happening, that's just not possible. But if you wanna lay your head down on your pillow at night and say, have I done everything I can to reasonably protect my organization? The GSOC environment with a sound intelligence program is the first step at doing that. Mm -hmm. One thing I've seen you talk about a couple different times in some different settings has been Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how it plays into security and thinking about the reality or the perception of well-being. You talk a little bit about how you've used that theory in some of your business case conversations. Absolutely. I, you know, we think about in a, in a modern Fortune 1000 organization, a modern healthcare organization, uh, how much we invest in things like employee development and, uh, you know, all of the, the things like fitness center and employee engagement and reduction of turnover. Uh, you know, we just actually uh, posted about uh, an article um, that was recently published that pointed to a lack of workplace safety as one of the top contributors to that uh, that $355 million turnover uh, challenge that organizations are facing. And Maslow's hierarchy, it, it helps us understand why that is. If people don't feel safe in the workplace, if they don't feel it like it, they can focus on their core business objectives, Everything, every dollar that you invest after that is not fully realized. And so the first goal of any uh, security organization should be to make sure that employees within that organization feel safe and customers and clientele within that organization feel safe in that environment. 
that becomes that, that foundation. And when we understand it from that perspective, we really need to invest there first. That doesn't mean we need to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in making sure that that's the only priority, but we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to provide a safe environment within reason. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you and I have talked about a few times, and I know we've had clients we've shared together and clients we've worked on separately that have struggled with this, is when you're undertaking one of these large initiatives like a GSOC, is to figure out the strategy first, and then you can move forward with the rest. Like everyone always wants to jump to, what's the cool technology? What are the SOPs I need to build? I need this mapping application. I need this surveillance application. I need 15 bodies to run the thing. And we always struggle with that, with that initially because we want to steer them back to, you have to figure out the strategy first and then downstream a strategy, you can figure out the rest of this. What's that? What does that look like from your experience? First, first off, I'll, I'll say I'm like everybody else. the The first time I had responsibility for my own security program, and I, I started putting a, a, a makeshift GSOC together in the basement. I didn't have a strategy either. Uh, I truly struggled with putting it together, and it was, you know, the problem was born out of the fact that the front desk wasn't working optimally because we had a security officer who was sitting in front of uh, a computer screen with camera views on it and also trying to check visitors in and couldn't do either job well. And so that became the initial problem I was trying to solve with my first monitoring center at that point. But what you, what you learn over time is that you can build slowly with that tactical approach to consolidating different security functions in a room but if you really want to be successful with your GSOC operation, again, you need the support and buy-in of the, the leadership of your organization at the right level. Mm -hmm. They need to understand the business strategy that you are using if they're going to support it. They're not going to, to dig into your GSOC operation for four hours and listen to all of the benefits of every one of the, the 80 tools that you're combining in that location to understand the true capabilities of it. You have to establish that strategic direction and be able to, to summarize that in something that you can cover in you know, five to 20 minutes worth of a presentation and be able to help them understand how it's going to improve the direction of their organization, solve a major problem that they're dealing with or propel their organization to, to a new level. And that's regardless of, again, of, of the industry vertical that, that you're working in. And if you're talking about retail, you have to make sure that your customers feel that safeness. Uh, if you're talking about an organization that has travelers moving all about the world, you don't want them worried about their safety or worried about what they're gonna do from a medical perspective if uh, they're going into a particular country where it might not have the, the best uh, infrastructure to provide those type of services. And when you can establish those core uh, strategic objectives and you can summarize that so that the leadership of your organization can see what you're trying to accomplish and you can summarize the value proposition that that program is going to bring to your organization that's what allows them to support it and be able to give you the additional airtime you're going to need mm -hmm. to tell them how much it's going to cost to build it and what those success measures and savings are going to be on the back end that you're, you're expecting to recapture. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, thanks for coming on and talking about GSOX. You can get our joint white paper on Global Security Operations Centers at brightpath.com slash GSOC or at corporatesecurityadvisors.com. Uh, Jeremy, thanks for coming on. Brian, thanks for having me. It's been a great yeah. uh, chance to talk with you. That's it for this episode of the Managing Uncertainty podcast. We'll be back next week with another new episode. Be well. Thanks for watching our video. To learn more about how to manage uncertainty and disruption in your organization, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to our video channel. And here are a few more videos that we've selected that will help you learn more about business continuity, crisis management, and crisis communications.